Yeah, he was going to try to bail on me, but our cinematographer, Miguel Litton Mintz, is here, and I'd like him to join us on the stage. All right, so collect some questions. Uh, I am going to start this off with, you know, usually in a sci-fi film, special effects are special effects. In, in a movie like this, though, it, the script and the performances I, 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 they're so, I, I mean, it's my third time watching the film and I find myself so um, transfixed by the performances and, and hanging on every word of the dialogue. How closely did you develop the screenplay with the writers and, uh, and working with the actors? Because the characters are so vividly drawn and I imagine a lot of it is scripted, but it's also so naturally conveyed. Yeah, yeah it was pretty close. Uh, there was a, couple of guys that I'm close to and we worked on it together and then ultimately came up with kind of a game plan we wanted to put a lot of limitations on. As you can tell, the limitations are the point. Um, locked in here, staying with these characters there. Uh, wanted it to feel like it could transcend mediums, like it could be a play or a podcast or a radio show or a book. And then ultimately kind of found these two and hung the whole movie on the performances. And uh, Jake and I here. They let me torture them for months ahead of time when I probably wasn't even allowed to, to try to get the performances where we wanted them. Which isn't it much? And, what was, yeah, what was the rehearsal? I imagine there must have been an extensive rehearsal. Yeah, but yeah, well, I mean, we came for like a week and a half before we started shooting yeah. anything. Yeah, we just hung out in hotel rooms with with um, tape recorders and switchboards, <laughs> and, uh, and, and ran the whole screenplay, like, every day. Yeah, it was amazing. What's like not saying is we actually literally moved switchboards into her room and tape recorders into his room, yeah. and I told them they weren't gonna get any favors from the editing in the, in the film, <laughs> so they had to be able to do it. And if you watch closely, he has a five minute scene where he threads up tapes, one after the other after the other, and she has a 10 minute scene where she actually runs a switchboard. And so we wanted it to work. And then I'm concerned the actors of times are in separate locations or not even on screen ever. Were they present for their, their, their conversations on set? No, Bruce probably shot his stuff. I don't know, if you can speak to that, Bruce. Uh, I'll read the story up. We went into the studio, I'm used to some voiceover uh, work, but this was a lot different. This director uh, really directed me for six hours straight. <laughs> and, uh, by the end of the, <laughs> end of the um, uh, time in the studio, my voice was a little sore. But uh, that's like all I got. But that was uh, the word I wanted. Was, yeah. It was everything you yeah. wanted. I didn't want him to sound fresh, so we, <laughs> we only used like the last five minutes. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so so I, I didn't even leave him until after after everything was finished. So, great director, great. You guys did wonderful. I'm going to throw it to the audience soon, but I'm anticipating the question is going to be how did you pull off V Shock? <laughs> well, there's about four of us here in the room, two of us are on stage. And there's two in the audience. And what we, I mean, the bottom line is we pulled out every trick we could possibly pull out of the book, right? So I brought Miguel in maybe a month before we were shooting. And I said, so Miguel is a brilliant cinematographer, probably a little bit too big for my budget. In fact, yeah, grab the mic and chime in. So, so he agrees to come to Whitney's No Man's Land, Texas, right? And, and I show him, like, here's a half mile a light place being the light. And it's a street, and it's a field, and it's a parking lot, and it's a gym, and then it's another field, and then it's other things, and then it's all, and by the way, we don't want to see any shadows whenever we're running the camera through it, and uh, I've never done anything like this before, so show me how to do it. <laughs> okay, and then, and then I've done a little bit of work here and there in commercials and had some gear to play around with, including gimbals and so on, and we, we had a collaborator who's one of our executive producers who we decided to uh, sacrifice his body and anything else. 
Marcus Ross, who literally, for real, uh, made himself out of a go kart that we sourced from an 18-year-old farm boy locally there in Wilmington, Texas, and he was our driver. And and so we would do things like run it out of the switchboard room, and then we would we would run it down the street and connect it up to a guy on the fucking go kart that was like on his belly, and then it was and then it was off to the races at 40 miles an hour, and then it was other handoffs. And yeah, and then it was, you know, build these lights in a way that whenever you pass underneath them, you don't have a shadow, you know, of this go-kart and this camera system. It was, you know, there, there's a little bit of things like, you know, we had to hide things in trees and we, but you know, that town doesn't look like it's from 1958 in the daylight. Uh, and so we actually had to go in and, and repaint things and, and, and move cars to where they hit things and then kind of snaked it around and then have this giant room full of about as many people here as you can imagine, and then you know had to have them doing their job, and then we kind of built it in a way that hopefully the reason you care about it is it's in the middle of a story that you're anticipating what's going to happen on the other end. Uh, yeah, I mean, one of the functions for me is it really clearly establishes geography in a way that in a movie like this you don't often see the filmmaker be able to take that opportunity. Yeah. Was that very important to? Like, it was hugely important. I mean, I wanted you to know that. She's here. Everyone's over here, and he's there. And and to build this, to, to raise the stakes that way, so that as the movie continues moving on down its, you know, merry path towards alien invasion, or whatever, you're kind of going, okay, this is this is maybe a little bit scarier because you realize there's nobody else that's going to experience this. So that was part of the point. Yeah. Questions in the audience, right there. So um, yeah, you saw my question about the shot, but. He did say it was pretty close. Yeah, it's almost exactly the scripts, like maybe a couple words here and there. But it's pretty much how I read it when, like, I got the audition. It's crazy. Yeah, it's an amazing script. Uh, right there. Can you talk a little bit about why the movie is framed with the television program mm -hmm. and kind of the pilot on that yeah. program that we kind of enter into and then revisit at that point? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to repeat the question for the back of the room about why the uh, film is framed by Paradox Theater, the television program. Yeah, there's a real simple answer, and that is uh, we knew everything we were doing in the movie was not original. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, blinking lights and sounds and blah, blah, blah. Look, if you take that away, all of a sudden, uh, we start getting law in you know the, the critics are saying oh well this is just the same it is the same story it's just the abduction story it, it's the story of somebody getting sucked up in space and we wanted to take that and then go we know what we're doing we're going to do it a little bit different way and we we wanted it to feel like anything from night gallery to twilight zone to x files to any crappy version of the story you see on cable any given night with bad reenactments and low production values we wanted to crawl in that piece of so it was a wink. It was definitely a, we, we're here with you when we wanted to feel like that. Uh, I'm going to get someone from the balcony first, just because they often get ignored. Is there anyone up there with a hand in the air? If not, uh, I'm going to go right down here. I was wondering if you could talk about the soft lenses that you use. Is that very interesting? The questions with the lenses. <laughs> I'm, uh, yeah, he wants me to, he's Chilean, and he has, he, he's, he's a fantastic DP. Like I said earlier, we were probably out of, uh, out of our budget to pull in, but but he, he was ultimately <laughs> sure I kind of sat at the, the the feet of him and learned everything. The it was super speeds. His eyes super speeds always at one point three. Uh, it was yeah two thousand ISO, and we would shoot with uh, we shot with six K dragons, so it was it's it's digital, and then we ran a, a sixteen millimeter film convert bolt on top of that, so it kind of has that you know softer look. Thank you. Right there. Um, I'm just curious, the uh, initial for the radio station, WPLU, is that, is that intentionally supposed to be warm or well? There are a lot of those in there. That's the most, <laughs> that's the most obvious one, but yeah. That was, Keep watching. Yeah. The initials of the radio station for the people in the back were the uh, W double O T W War the World. Right over there. How many days did you guys shoot it Seventeen. In fact, yeah, seventeen days. <laughs> 
it has one of those nights where, where they, you know, you got a scene with her where she'll run, you know, 25 pages of the movie in one take. That's the only way we were able to do the crazy stuff with the go-kart and everything else. I feel on the subject of 17 Days, I'm looking at the producers and going, yeah. <laughs> how? <laughs> Uh, that's probably where I came in quite a bit, because um, I'm a line producer and uh, uh, and producer. And I mean, it was just major planning. First of all, Andrew showed up very prepared. He, he'd been prepping. Uh, he knew what he wanted to do. And uh, it was very ambitious, and we talked about that while we were our first meeting. And, uh, and we never worked together. And so I was like, all right, well, we'll figure it out. And um, and we did. I mean, and, and it was, I mean, it was a, a team effort of everybody just being extremely prepared. And of course, we had issues and problems and things didn't work out. And you had to get creative, like you always do, no matter what your budget is. Um, but especially when you're independent and you're shooting in three weeks. So um, yeah, it was hard, but <laughs> it was pretty awesome. I mean, it was crazy because it was all night shooting on top of it, which is definitely not Melissa's favorite thing. Because um, somebody has to get up and like pay the bills every day, and so I just, that kind of equals like not sleeping for me. But um, in a weird sort of way, it, it helped us because the town that we're shooting in, that's a real town in Texas, a really small, real town in Texas. And so we basically owned that town. And when it, uh, we did, like they were great. They rolled up the red carpet, pretty much like the, the cops um, uh, who we hired to, you know, do street closures and stuff. Uh, but the whole town just rolled up the red carpet for us. And so we needed like a shovel in the middle of the night. They were like, oh, we can go unlock such and such a store and borrow one. And, and when the cops are doing that for you, you're like, okay. You know, it's on you. Um, but uh, but it was that kind of thing. So it was also in a weird sort of a way. Um, we had our own town. Every day, once it went dark, every day, uh, once the sun set, it was like the town just became ours. And then it was no longer uh, that town. It became Cayuga, and, and, and we filmed all night. It was awesome. And they, and they helped us. I mean, in the town, we laid sand all across their downtown. So we covered every piece of pavement with sand. The, the chief of police helped us do that. <laughs> then he picked it up for us at the end. <laughs> chief Bentley, he's amazing. And uh, they let you remove every single piece of modern anything from their downtown. So all of those store owners. Adam was a production designer all. of film, too. So it's not just he did produce it, but that was that. All of those store owners, it's, you know, it's not a government thing. Each of those people had to make the choice to allow us to remove their stuff. Some of them gave us their keys, like Melissa was saying, so that when they're gone at night, we can go into their stores. <laughs> uh, you know, so it was that kind of stuff. But uh, going also back to Andrew's uh, 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 preparedness, and also uh, that guy Marcus we mentioned earlier, and this guy Caleb Henry, who's another executive producer, these guys are amazing. Yeah, very early on, after I signed on the project, Andrew calls me and he says, Adam, we've got to get some uh, practical light sources um, that are period appropriate. They need to be gigantic. They need to be things that would have been in the exteriors of locations. So we go out and source, I don't know, maybe 30 lights, uh, something like that. And, we, and Miguel's there, and we all kind of get work together, me, Miguel, and Andrew, to pick these lights. And then Caleb, and Marcus, and I think Nathan, I don't know, maybe just Caleb and Marcus, hang these lights during the off hours. So they start hanging them in pre-pro from a very, very early stage, but it's so much that they continue into production, and we've shot all day, and now these guys are working for another two to four hours to put this stuff up into the into the downtown area and other areas of the movie. So it's like the work never stopped for almost all of our team, Sierra's in our hotel on our off days, working the switchboard, just, you know. Every single person on the team kind of took above and beyond in that way. There's a question right there, we only have time for a few more. Yeah, this film really did take the producer thing to be sci-fi, so like how much time and effort went into it, and then the props that we saw, the props we saw, the kids that we captured that. 
question was about how the film paid tribute to 1950s sci-fi. How much research and effort went into the period of detail? A lot of research and effort, specifically radios and switchboards. Those people are dying out that did that. So a whole lot of work went into making sure that it was period accurate down to the nth degree. Uh, and then you had, we had a wonderful costume supervisor who went out for six months to every Goodwill, probably in Oklahoma and Texas, and bought everything. And, and literally our costume wardrobe shop looked like just a Goodwill. Um, and then at the thrift store. And then we had those on standby, which is how we were able to fill a whole stadium of people. And then props and everything else was back to Adam, that production design. We didn't use any movies as references. We only used a doc footage from the time, if there was any real, or, or magazines, uh, yearbooks, that kind of thing. So we didn't use any other period movie to reference. It was all real archival material. There and then there, and then we're gonna have to end it. Yes? I thought I saw thank you to Kevin Durant. <laughs> thank you to Kevin Durant? There is a thank you to Kevin Durant. There is a very, very distinct tie to Kevin Durant. He doesn't know, he kind of does, I don't think he does. But we, my company worked in the NBA for a whole year before this. Uh, we've done commercials, we're out of Oklahoma City, so we were doing Oklahoma City Thunder, it's our last season with Kevin Durant, which he left us, which I know you people can relate to that. I mean, it's <laughs> pretty brutal, pretty hard, but we were there first. So three years ago, he leaves us, and the whole time, my company is the one kind of trying, as uh, several other groups, to keep him around. And we were in charge of all the media that played inside of the stadium and so on, cinematic type stuff. So we were using the same cameras and the same gimbals and so on. In fact, that's kind of how my camera crew came together for the massive night. And so if Kevin Durant had been 100% happy in Oklahoma City, my company never would have gotten the job, and then the budget for the vast of night might not have been what it is. And so he has a very direct connection to why we're all sitting here tonight. So. Thank you, Kevin. Go ahead, Kevin. special part of it to me. We, it took us five or six months to find these two. Like, we saw 600 girls in the Oklahoma, Texas, New Mexico area. And I just was like, no, they're just, they're not there. And then, and then I just thought I'd call her Faye. Sierra, she is her own person. She and I, my casting director finally said, why don't you try this girl? And I was like, well, let me see what I can get. So she and I connected, we had a good phone call, and she threw in her audition. I was like, this is gonna be awesome. But I, I was still just sort of like, you know, let me, let me, let me think about it. Let me have a weekend to figure it out. And then that night she texted me and said, I'm going to work harder for you than anybody else. I am Faye. I'm going to kill this role. And so, well, she, she did. And I, it's literally the first message in my phone from her from about three years ago. And that I just thought, okay, this girl must know something. And, and I thought if she's going to be willing to work that hard, uh, I'm, I, I'm going to do it. And then Jake came after two or three hundred guys auditioned in, in Texas, New Mexico, didn't find it, and I asked my casting director, let's go to New York, please. And the first person that came up out of 300 auditions was him. And, and I was sort of like, everyone was up to his standard. And what I saw in him was he had control that a lot of other guys didn't have. He could, he could say his line and then 